I think we can do better than that, man. We just, we just said a blessing over ourselves. Clap your hands. You got to believe it. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands like you know it. You know that you know that you know your life is going to get better than it has been. Come on, your best days are ahead of you, not behind you. Don't let the devil tell you that. It's going to get better for you. You're going to grow. You're going to, you're going to evolve. You're going to, you're going to expand. <clears throat> Before you sit down, let me just share one thing to you. Remember that in the book of Genesis, God was speaking to Adam and Eve, and uh, we call it the dominion mandate, but he, he, it says he blessed them, and then he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue, and take dominion. But the first thing he said was he blessed them. And the thought occurred to me, how did they really know that he blessed them? Because at that moment, it wasn't like everything changed. At that moment, it wasn't like they sprouted wings and suddenly everything was just perfect. So how did they know that they were really blessed? How did they know? They knew like we know. God said it. That settles it. I've heard people say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, it really doesn't matter if you believe it or not. God said it. And that settles it. Now believe it. You are blessed. Come on, get that in your mind. Get it down in your heart. Get it down in your spirit. Walk around here and find some folks that you haven't spoken to yet. Shake their hand. Will you do that? Hug their neck. Welcome them to the service today. Look all the way around you, 360 degrees. Welcome them to Open Door. I want to thank everyone for watching online. Thank you for being a part of this service today. I hope you've enjoyed our teen praise and worship band. And uh, I hope that you enjoy the message. We're going to be preaching here in just a moment. If you want to uh, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. You can go to our Facebook page, Open Door Ohio. We appreciate you being online, a part of our service. Thank you for watching this week. I want to make a bold declaration over you. I want to say to you that there's greatness in you. There's greatness in you. I want, to, I, want to, I want to say something over you today that there's such greatness in you that when you don't achieve greatness, it seems like it's not right. That's how much greatness is in you. I, I, I want to say that every time you go shopping for produce at the grocery store, the greatness that is in you motivates you to look for the best apple in the whole bin. I mean, you don't look for the mediocre apple. You don't look for the apple that, you know, is about half bruised. When you look for the bunches of bananas, you, you don't look for the ones that are just a little bit brown or black. When you go to the grocery store, the very greatness that is in you, listen to me, the very greatness and the expectation of greatness is so strong on you, it even motivates how you pick out your fruit. Let me tell you how much greatness there is in you. There's so much greatness in you that when things are mediocre and they don't measure up to your standard of greatness, something seems wrong. That's why we're not going to put up with Ohio State basketball getting beat in the first round of the NCAA tournament. That's why Thad Mata doesn't want to put up with it. That's why his players don't want to put up with it. And that's why the fans don't want to put up with it. Because in our hearts, we have greatness. We know intuitively we were made for greatness. And when greatness does not, does not reveal itself, then something in our heart says this is, this is not right. That's why we want our sports teams to win. That's why when our kids are playing softball, we want them to go four for four. That's why when things don't work out, it bothers you. Maybe you didn't understand why you get depressed or you get upset or you get nervous or you get anxious. You know what that is? That is greatness desiring to come out of you. Some of you are not happy with yourself because you, you may be a bit overweight or you're not happy with yourself because you didn't finish college. You're not happy with yourself because uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, of your achievements so far in life. And, and we can let those feelings of unhappiness take control over us, which is not healthy. But what I'm trying to do is put it all in context. Why do you feel unhappy? 
Why do you look in the mirror and say, you know what, I could, I could do better than this? Why do you look maybe at your job or, or, or where you live or you look at your marriage and you think, you know, we could, we could have a better marriage than this and you're not satisfied with a mediocre marriage. In fact, you really need to be worried when you are satisfied with a mediocre marriage. The reason we're not satisfied, the reason things bother us that way is because we have greatness in us. We were meant for greatness. God designed us for greatness. God invested himself in us. And it's that desire, it's that burning desire to be the best that we can possibly be that gets you out of bed in the morning. It's that burning desire to be the best you can be that, that puts you in the shower and puts deodorant on your body in the morning. That's why you brush your teeth. That's why you got dressed up today. That's why you spent some time in front of the mirror. Ladies, that's why you spent some time putting some makeup on because something in you says, you know what? I have something in me called greatness. And I want to look the best that I can look. I want to be the best that I can be. And listen, when we do not achieve that, it's painful. One of the most painful things that you'll ever experience is when you do not achieve your potential. Much of the pain that we try to medicate is pain that is experienced because we have not reached our potential. And deep down we know it. Deep down we know we should have got better grades and could have got better grades. And so the pain of not meeting our potential begins to build up in our heart. I believe a lot of the pain that we try to medicate is the pain of knowing that we have not reached our potential. Sometimes then that pain drives us to get obsessed with things. Have you met someone that's obsessed with something? It's obsessed with collecting something or obsessed with doing an activity and, and it's overboard. It's just, just it, it's, it's out of control. And I think that sometimes what we do is we're trying to make up for not meeting our potential in one area, trying to compensate by going overboard in another area. I believe that's why some people sit for hours and play a game. Something in you is yearning and crying out for greatness. That's why you play a game and you, when you don't complete that level or you don't complete that mission or whatever it is, the game, video game that you're playing, something in you compels you to say, reset, I'm doing it again. Why is that? Why, why do people spend hours and hours in front of those game systems? Because something in them says you're a winner, you're not a loser. You were designed for greatness, not mediocrity. Something in them says you are an achiever and you're not happy until you're achieving something, overcoming something. And I wonder who put that in us. Then if that greatness is in us, we see it come out in our expectations for athletes and we see that come out in us in all these different ways my question is if greatness is in us then why do we settle for spiritual mediocrity if we're displaying greatness even when we want to find the best fruit in the apple bin then how come we can't apply that very same thing to our relationship with God one reason is because the devil's not fighting you to find the best apple in the bin but you've got a very real adversary that is battling your mind this very moment. You have a very real adversary that's been working on you already this morning. You have a very real adversary right now that's trying to speak to you and trying to distract you and trying to get you to think on other things. You have a very real adversary right now that's trying to take every word that I'm saying to you and trying to tell you something the opposite and trying to tell you something different, trying to convince you of something other. Because the devil's worst nightmare is that somebody in this room might wake up to the fact that there's greatness in you and you take that desire for greatness and you apply it to your relationship with God. Because the fact is, there are more important things than finding a great apple or a great bunch of bananas. Believe it or not, parents, there's even something more important than your child achieving greatness on the athletic field. Believe it or not, there's even something greater than achieving greatness in your bank account or your job. 
All of those things are worthy endeavors. Don't misunderstand me. Very worthy endeavors we should excel in. But I promise you the most important thing in your life is your relationship with God. And your life being given to the service of His kingdom. We see glimpses in Scripture of the last judgment day. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on the earth on the day of Pentecost, and I say the earth, He was not just poured out in the upper room. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the earth. Because God told His disciples earlier in John 17 that the Holy Spirit will speak to the whole world. And He will reprove the world or convict the world of three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Do you realize the Holy Spirit is our helper, not just to give me strength in my daily life, but He's also wanting to help us reach the lost. The fact is, the Holy Spirit's doing His job this morning in Chillicothe, but it's not Him we have to worry about. The question is, are we doing our job? When the Holy Spirit was poured out on the world, He began to move into the nations of the earth. He began to move in the back alleys and streets of the Roman Empire. He went through the villages of the deep Amazon jungle and through the jungles of Africa and the city streets of the burgeoning nations like France and Great Britain. Those people living in that time, believe it or not, began to wake up in their souls to three things. Sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Sin, what is wrong? Righteousness, what is right? But judgment to come. There is a nagging sensation in the heart of humans around the world that says, I am accountable for the decisions I'm making right now. I will be held accountable for what I say. I will be held accountable for what I do. Judgment to come. We have glimpses of the judgment. And in those glimpses, we're told some things. And one of the things we're told is that we'll stand before Jesus and Jesus will ask us some things. He will talk to us about some things. He's going to investigate some things. He's going to pry into your life. You think your neighbors are nosy? Wait till you stand before Jesus. You're worried about your Facebook posts and how many people know what you're doing? Wait, wait till you stand before Jesus. Because you're going to stand before him as I will. And he's not going to ask us about all the things that we really, really maybe think about as being great. He's not even going to touch those things. What he's going to say, according to Scripture, is things like, you know, I, I was naked. Did you feed me? Did, did you clothe me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? In other words, he's going to ask us specific questions about what we did in his name for other people. He's going to ask us how we treated people. He's going to ask us, did we serve them? He's going to ask us, what did we do? In other words, he's going to ask us this question. Were you a great Christian or were you nominal, mediocre, half-hearted, lukewarm? There's a very scary scripture when Jesus was talking to the church at Laodicea in the third chapter of Revelation because he said to this, this to them. He said, I would rather have you hot or cold. This lukewarm thing makes me sick. He said, I will spew you out of my mouth. That's a nice King James way of saying, you make me sick, I'm going to vomit you. His words, not mine. That literally should scare us. There is no problem with having a fear of God. None whatsoever. Today we want to make God our little, our little lap child. Or we want to make God our sugar daddy. Or we want to make God our little puppy dog. You know, somebody that makes us happy and somebody that's our little buddy and he follows us along and he sprinkles pixie dust in our life and he just makes everything all right. But God is none of those things. God is the judge, the king, the Lord of all judges, of all kings, and of all lords. God is the only one who is just and perfect in his judgments. God is the only one that you really have to answer to. In the end, it's Him. It's not me. It's not your neighbor. It's not people around. It's Him. And He knows your heart. I don't. He knows your thoughts, and I don't. He knows your intentions and your motives. I don't. God's going to pry into your heart, and you're going to stand there absolutely exposed in every way before your judge and mine. And he's going to judge us not on whether we were mediocre and lukewarm. In fact, he said, lukewarm Christians make me sick. 
But did you serve people? Did you do it in my name? Did you feed people? Were you loving to people? How did you treat people? It's all about what we did in terms of ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. But here's the good news. The good news is you have greatness in you. The good news is being lukewarm makes you sick too. When you watch your team play basketball, if you're a sports fan, or you watch them play baseball, or you watch them play football, there's nothing more nauseating than a great athlete with great potential that doesn't give a care. They don't give a darn about the game. You can tell by the way that they walk. You can tell by the way they play the game. They've got all the potential in the world, but they won't step up. They won't do anything about it. You know that they can achieve this, but they're achieving this. That makes us angry. That makes us frustrated. That makes us sick because we know that greatness is inside of us. We see that potential. But I want to ask you about your spiritual life today. Are you that athlete that has this great potential? But when you come to church, you kind of saunter in late. Uh-oh. See, here's the good gospel news today. Our teen band was worshiping. I didn't see you come in, so I don't know who I'm talking to right now. How do you treat what God has given us called the church? How do you treat that? Are you like the great athlete that has great potential and you're settling for mediocrity, settling to be lukewarm? Or is there something in you today that's being stirred up as I speak that says, you know, I know I can be a great Christian. You look up to the screen. I've just been several weeks on this. I didn't plan this. There's no strategy to this other than every week when I'm thinking about what God wants me to say, I just can't get off this. We need to be a great church. In my opinion, every church in Chillicothe, Ross County, Southern Ohio, and the world needs to be a great church because I believe Jesus Christ deserves great churches. I believe the world deserves great churches. The unsaved, the lost, the unchurched people that need Jesus, they deserve to walk into a church and hear the gospel without apologetics, without apologies. They need to hear the gospel without it being sugar-coated and watered down. When people come to church, they need to have great Christians embrace them and love them right where they're at. Our parking lot attendants should have a smile on their face and wave to people and welcome people because our parking lot attendants are the first line of contact, the first level of contact when people come on this property. I believe your children deserve a great church. I posted on Facebook. I took a picture and posted on Facebook while these guys were singing. By the way, we have no problem with you on your cell phones. If you hear something you like, tweet it. Put it on Facebook. I don't care. I crossed that bridge a long time ago. We used to, you know, when cell phones first became popular, our ushers had this terrible job of trying to keep people off the cell phones, which was an impossibility, so we just reversed it. Now I just encourage people, get on a cell phone and post these things. And what I notice, cell phone use now is down. Amazing. When you weren't allowed to do it, it was like, now it's no fun because you're allowed. So I posted on Facebook. I took a picture of our teen band and I posted on Facebook. I said, most of those young men and women on there, most of them, I dedicated when they were babies. When they were born, they deserved a great church. When they were in kids' ministry, they deserved a great church. Now that they're young adults and coming into their own, they still deserve a great church. And you may be sitting there like me. You've become a grandparent now. And maybe you're in those twilight years, the fourth quarter of your life, whatever you want to call it. I say to you, you deserve a great church. When you look up there and you see we need to be a great church, here's what I want you to see. We don't need to be a great church necessarily. What we need are great Christians. Because the church is not the building. The church is not the service. The church is not the organizational structure. The church, the church is the people who are sitting in these chairs today. And in order to have a great church, you've got to have great Christians. My point is just to encourage you and to tell you, to get you to believe that you're blessed and you have greatness in you already. It's not a very far jump to go from lukewarm to great. There's been books written about it. Jim Collins wrote a book. It's a classic. I have it at my library. I still see it sold in bookstores. A book called Good to Great. 
When I, when I watch NASCAR, you know, I know the first place driver, he may get twice as much money as the second place driver, but he didn't drive twice as fast. After 500 miles, he may only finish a couple of feet ahead of the second place guy. You know, you know, you know going from good to great is not a matter of miles and miles. It's only a matter of inches. Going from good to great is just saying, I'm going to make a decision to do a few things differently in my life. And when you apply your desire for greatness to your spiritual life and your relationship with God, you are applying it to the greatest thing that you'll ever apply it to. Here's why. One day, your athletic career is going to be over. Guys, I'm going to give you some reality therapy. It's over. I got in last night, I, about 2 o'clock in the morning. I flew back in from Puerto Rico. I was out of, out of, uh, in Puerto Rico to do a conference this weekend and flew out. Got in, I, I, it was, I don't know, 1 in the morning. I'm driving in Columbus home, and I see all these bright lights, you know, about where the Frank Road exit is there on 71, if you know where, where that is. And, and you know what it was? It was all those softball fields. I look out there, it's 1.30 in the morning. And there's like three or four softball games going on. I drove by there and I thought, good grief. Number one, none of those people are going to be in church tomorrow morning. That was my first thought. My second thought was, wow, I wish we could produce Christians that were so radical about their relationship with God as those fools are relationship with a softball. Number three, I thought, don't they know that's, they're trying to live the glory days? I drove by there and I was, I was, I, I, I was looking like this. Well, it was too, no one's on the highway much. But, and I just had to thought, you know what? That's a, bunch of, that's a bunch of old, broke down athletes who are unfulfilled trying to recapture their glory days. But listen, you know why? Because... They have greatness on the inside of them. And there are a bunch of middle-aged men tried to make up for not reaching their potential and not reaching their greatness when they were young. You have greatness in you. It's born. You can't help it. The most satisfying, most beautiful thing you'll ever do is when you apply that greatness to your relationship with God. Here's why. Because it's the really only thing that matters. We stood around my mother's casket right here, right here at this spot. A year and a half before that, we stood around my father's casket right here at this very spot. We said our goodbyes as we sang around this casket. And at that moment, dad's cattle didn't mean anything to us. And the barn and the house and the cars. At that moment, the only thing that mattered was, my God, thank you, that our parents instilled something in us that said, we love sports, it's good. My mom, till the day she died, would stay up late at night watching ESPN. She loved March. She loved basketball. But she loved Jesus even more. And when I stand before God, when my mother stood before the Lord, he didn't ask her, hey, Thelma, what was, your, what, was your, what was your points per game when you played? See, what you may not know about my mom, incredible lady, she held the scoring record in Ross County in basketball. She was Miss Ross County. And then she married a preacher, my dad, when she was a senior in high school and quit everything. Beauty queen, athlete, married the preacher, let's serve God. That's my heritage and that's your heritage. That's the only thing that matters. The greatness that you have inside your heart was meant to be applied to your relationship with God, how you serve other people, the good that you do to other people, every person in here. The greatness that's in you ought to motivate you to say something like this. The world, I'm determined, the world is going to be a better place because I lived in it. The world is going to be a better place because I lived in it.
That doesn't mean that you have to be a world leader or you have to be world renowned and world popular. All that means is look at the world around you and determine the greatness that burns in you. You're going to use that to serve God, to love people. And when you do that, literally, you will make the world around you a better If you have your notes today, and by the way, if you're a first-time guest, we have notes when you come into the building at the registration tables. Maybe you didn't know that. You'll know it when you come back next week. Notice I didn't say if. I said when you come back next week. I want you to look at the ten descriptions of what a great church is been covering these notes and using these notes in fact I'm going to be using them again next week so you can just hang on to them or or better yet don't hang on to these go ahead and get new ones because on the back you'll have all the important announcements so even though the notes may be the same go ahead and pick up a new set because we also put all the important announcements in the church on the back of the notes let's look at this list together are you ready number one a great church is full of great Christians that's what I've been saying for two weeks. You need to determine to be a great Christian. I want to ask you a question. You can raise your hand. You can answer this question. What, in your opinion, does it mean? What does it look like for somebody to be a great Christian? Maybe you've never even thought about that before. What's it look like? A great Christian is a person that serves others. Excellent. What else? In your mind, what does a great Christian look like? Yes. Every aspect in life, they just do the best they can. Whether it's mowing their grass, working the job that they've been given, they put their best foot forward. Notice that already, just in these two descriptions, you're hearing Christians do something. I think sometimes we get this idea that being, being a Christian means I'm just saved and forgiven. Woo, it's done. You were not saved by good works, but it's clear the very next verse in Ephesians 2 says you were saved for good works. Not by good works, but you were saved for good works. What else? A, good, a great Christian loves people despite what they look like, what they've done. It's not easy, but it's possible. What else? Unbreakable faith. That no matter what your trial is, no matter what you're going through, you know that you're blessed. Just like Adam and Eve. The only evidence they had that they were blessed was that God said it. He said it, that settles it. What else? What does a great Christian do? What does it look like? What does it mean to you, a great Christian? Discipline. Yeah, there's something that drives us to discipline. If you're going to be a great, a great secretary, a great athlete, if you're going to be a great artist, if you're going to be a great anything, you've got to discipline yourself to practice, to do your trade, whatever it is. What else? What else, Matt Sams? A great Christian is merciful. Not this harsh, judgmental thing that we point our fingers at everybody and, and, and declare their wrongness, their faults, that there's mercy extended to people. Yes. They're real, transparent, not fake and phony. This is who I am. Even real with my faults and my struggles. What else? Consistency. We need to work to achieve consistency. Where we're not up and down, we love people one day, we hate them the next. I mean, if that's your struggle in the process of being great, that's okay. But you've got to struggle against that. You've got to have a goal in your life of consistency. One more. Who else had something? Raise your hand. Yes. Forgiving. Forgiveness is not telling people what they did was okay. Forgiveness is releasing yourself from the control of that event. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison hoping the other person gets sick. Number two, look at the screen or you can look at your notes. Great Christians focus on people. We focus on people. That means we love people, we serve people. The Sunday after, the Sunday after Easter, 
we've made that invite a family Sunday <clears throat> you know why because a lot of people come on Easter and we're making a deliberate point to try to get them back the next Sunday to let people know we love them to let people know this is a place for them that they can grow and they can bring their families this is a place where they can be nurtured into fruitfulness we focus on people a great church is not about the music it really isn't I mean, that, that's great but to me it's not the music that excites me what excites me is that we've got several young people up there with their gifts trying to be great a great church number three strives for excellence we need to strive for excellence open door that's why I say to about the parking lot attendants you know strive for excellence excellence our greeters strive for excellence get yourself a breath mint put a smile on your face to our ushers to the people teaching our children listen to me children's ministry is not babysitting children's ministry is not a chore children's ministry is developing the next generation of world changers somebody in children's ministry impacted the lives of those young people we saw this morning number four great churches everyone does their part we had a ministry fair a few weeks ago but over here in the in in the members lounge we have we have everything you need to sign up and get started serving in a ministry if you're not serving you're not growing if you, if you think, please don't think this, that you can show up here for two hours a week and like, this is it. This is going to be, I promise you this. Here's what I've seen for 23 years. People who just show up but don't serve don't stay long. When you played sports, you didn't like setting the bench. So why do you settle for it now? Man, when I played, I didn't know the rules, the unwritten rules. So I started playing peewee football in fourth grade, and I wasn't even supposed to play. I was too young. But no one asked me, so I just kept playing. They didn't even find out till the end of the season. And I remember my coach used to get so perturbed with me because I didn't know any better. I would just say, hey, hey, coach, okay, put me in. Can I go in now? I mean, I wasn't ready. I wasn't big enough. I wasn't strong enough. But there was something in me that said I wasn't made for the bench. Hello? Yeah. Don't set the bench. The same greatness needs to put you into the game. Number five, great churches know how to pray. I was so blessed today when I walked into the back there. And since I got in really late, I, uh, I had Bryce take our 9 a.m. way and to lead in our pre-service pep rally at 9. So I got here just before the service started. And uh, I, as I walked in, the, the intercessors were coming down that stairway. Guys, you don't know what a blessing that was to me. I mean, I, I just about fell on the floor, believe it or not. So I watched one, two, three. They just kept coming down those steps. I wanted to go up there. There's a little bathroom up there. I wanted to go to the bathroom. I couldn't go to the bathroom. Those prayer warriors just kept on coming out of that room. Great churches know how to pray. But you know what? We need more people praying. We have a Wednesday prayer meeting from noon till one. We need you here. Number six, great churches are full of worshipers. A lot of times I have you stand up, I have you clap your hands. I, I try to elicit praise out of you, and there's a reason for that. The reason is because you got two things working against you. Number one, you got your flesh. Your flesh hates to praise God. Number two, you got the devil against you. Because the devil's going to try to keep you away from praising God. You need to understand the adversary walks in here with you and tries to keep you out of the greatness. Number seven, great churches. Just look down at your notes. Number seven, a great church is a church that cares for the community. Everybody in this place ought to go back there and sign up for the, for the run. I mean, even if you walk it. You know what, even if you don't even plan to be there, it's 20-some bucks, and we're going to buy the fireworks for our city this year. We talked to the mayor. He said that was a need. We're going to do our best. We're going to try to buy the fireworks. So when the people of Ross County gather on the 4th of July to watch those fireworks, whether they realize it or not, it's going to be a gift. It's going to be a gift from the body of Christ to our community. 
Number eight. A great church cares for the next generation. I hope you saw that this morning. Number nine. A great church cherishes the word of God. And number ten. Great church becomes a great church when people decide to make it one. See, it's, really, it's, it's, it's not up to me. Pastors don't make great churches. I've been all around the world. I promise you, I know what I'm talking about. Pastors don't make great churches. Great worship leaders don't make great churches. Great elders and deacons don't make great churches. You know what makes great churches? Great congregations. Great Christians. And I want you to decide in your heart. I'm asking you to decide in your heart to make a commitment to be great. I'm asking you to take all of that desire and all of that that's in you that I've talked about today that's applied to all kinds of different things. I'm asking you to make the best decision you'll ever make in your life, and that is to apply that desire for greatness to your relationship with God. It's the only thing that lasts forever. It's the only thing that's really worth it. Everything else is temporary. Everyone, please stand with me. I want you to bow your heads, please, and close your eyes. In just a minute, I'm going to ask some, some people to start raising your hand. And so because of that, I'd like for everyone, including the balcony, every, everywhere, if you would, just to bow your heads, close your eyes. I don't want you to intimidate anyone. I, I want people to feel at this moment it really is about them and God, about nobody else. And what I'd like for you to do is to raise your hand if this describes you. You're not born again. You're not saved. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I didn't say that you've never been to church. Yeah, you've been to church, and you've maybe even as an infant was christened. But as an adult making an adult decision, you've never given your heart to Jesus. That means you never come to a point where you said, God, forgive me for my sin. I want to make you my Lord, my Savior. I want to make God my Father, and I'm giving my life to him. That's a big decision. I don't want you to do it half-heartedly. I don't want you to do it without making a commitment in your mind. But if you feel like today, wow, Pastor Mark, today's my day. My day personally for me was June 23rd, 1980. I was 16 years old. I made a commitment. I didn't make a decision. I made a commitment. I'm not asking you to make a decision. I'm asking you something very pointed, very detailed, a commitment to God. And if you've never done that before, and today's your day, I want you to lift up your hand. Will you do it? Just lift up your hand. Thank you. God bless you. Anyone else? Just, just raise your hand. Today's my day. I'm not going to come back there and, and call you out. I'm not going to do that. We're just going to say a prayer together in a moment. But I want to make sure if anyone else is here that you're not born again, you're not saved, you really don't consider yourself a Christian. And you know that. The Holy Spirit is moving on you now and you feel guilty and you feel your palms sweating and you know you get started getting anxiety. Someone told me one time, they said, boy, I hate it when you do that torture treatment. I said, what do you mean? He said, that thing you do, you know, when you pray at the end, boy, that's just torture. You know what? It is when you know that God's dealing with you. What is that? That's God's love for you. Just raise your hand. That's you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Anyone else? Now, we're going to say a prayer together. There's been three or four people that's raised their hands. Number one, I want you to say this prayer from your heart. I'm going to lead you in it, but I want you to say it from your heart, not just because you're repeating after me. And number two, if you raised your hand and you would like to come forward and meet me here, then I'm going to invite you to do that. And it takes a lot of guts, doesn't it? It takes a lot. It takes, it takes a lot. But here's what I've always thought. If you have 
a hard time doing it in front of a bunch of Christians that want to cheer you on. Yeah, it's going to be pretty tough to do it outside when people are trying to stand against you. So if you want to come forward now, if you raised your hand or if you didn't, and you want to come forward now, I will meet you here, and there will be leaders in our church who will pray with you. But I want the whole congregation now to say this prayer. Even if you're born again, everybody say this prayer. If you raised your hand, you say it too. From your heart, because the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. If you say this from your heart, confess it with your mouth, if you should die today, you will go to heaven. Let's say this together. Everybody say, God Almighty, I believe that Jesus is your son. And I have sinned many times. I can't pay the penalty for all my sin. But I believe that Jesus took my penalty. And I ask you now to forgive my sins. I repent and turn my life around. And I believe that you love me. Jesus died for the sins of the world. I believe I'm going to stand before you one day. And I say with confidence now, that will be a beautiful day. Since you've forgiven my sins, I'm your child. And I make my covenant with you today in the name of Jesus to give my whole life and eternity to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands, church.